Hello everyone, this is Dark Journalist. Tonight I have a special interview for you with intuitive mystic Gigi Young. Gigi's grasp of the esoteric and the armonic forces operating in plain sight is remarkable and today she's going to show us how the mystery schools, UFO file, powerful elite, and the pages of history are all going to come together and unfold in this cosmic battlefield of truth, half-truth, and fiction. Please join us now. Gigi, it's great to have you back. Let's start with the astroturfing we see all over the mainstream on these topics. There's this level of it that's true, but then it, it starts getting distorted further and further into basically delusion and, yeah. and, and fantasy. And I think it's just that, you know, in, in the mystery school tradition, you have to have a very high initiation to be able to talk about these kinds of things without it going into some kind of fantastical, you know, dream world experience. And the problem is, is that a lot of people, when they do begin to wake up, um, they, they believe these things because suddenly their whole world is different than it was yesterday. And a lot of things they thought were impossible or conspiracy theories are now true right and so why can't somebody be in a cave with a reptilian you know because in in, in their mind they're in that hypnagogic state of awakening where people are already um sort of seeing their world fall apart that they, they become very vulnerable to that kind of stuff and the proof of this is that this kind of, of material is so common in the new age. It is so popular in the new age. It is actually probably becoming over the last 10 years, the most popular kind of information. It's called star seed information. Mm -hmm. um, and I believe it is a <clears throat> natural movement into the Aquarian age, which is a kind of cosmic spirituality. It's where we see the, the cosmos um, as a spiritual being. Mm -hmm. and ourselves within it and we look at the different planetary spheres and we kind of expand ourselves and we also see christ in the cosmos and the cosmic christ and all this kind of beautiful information about how the soul moves in the cosmos that's a genuine level of aquarian spirituality that we'll move into but how it's manifesting is actually in the, the idea of aliens and extraterrestrials and sort of bizarre looking beings and sort of UFO cults um, and quite frankly, teachings and things that don't recognize any, that, that don't resemble any of the true esoterica around these topics. It's, it's becoming like a garish caricature of what it really should be. And it's very, it's becoming really popular because the impulse is to go cosmic, which is also why we see disclosure and the government slowly wanting to like creep its way into this conversation, control it, because that's where we're going. But um, it's, again, it's a garish caricature of what it should be that's lacking any kind of spiritual it's a spiritual topic too. I know we've had this conversation and it's like, it's not a military topic, you know, interdimensional beings, even advanced technology. This is not a topic for the government or the military. This is a spiritual topic. Right. From, it, it involves dimensional shifting and density shifts. So it is a spiritual topic. It's not the topic where you should have like a, the military talking about it and the government talking about it. They don't belong. In the condition that it is, they do not belong in the topic. And that that's my opinion. So interesting. Wow. Well, you've been very good at raising alarm bells about this and doing it in such a way that, you know, you're not hitting people over the head with it, but you're saying, look, you know, there there is no third way. You know, it's not that you can have a false thing side by side with this true thing and you get by. You have to kind of figure out which one is telling you the truth. Um, so around disclosure and things of this nature, it's funny because we're getting all these different things rolled in. I'm glad actually you started with the UFO one, but we've seen also that they're talking about, well, it's undersea, you know, there's a whole civilization undersea and we might be, you know, that might be what they're hiding there. And we see undersea trends the same way we saw UFO trends rolled out 
a couple of years ago. So there's a menace under the seas, Gigi, all of a sudden. Yes, the trans medium. That's it. The technology, <laughs> it's trans medium. The UAP task force, they, they yeah. came up with it. Yeah, trans medium now. And it's USOs, and of course there's USOs. That's been that's been talked about for right. uh, actually thousands of years. No, no, TPSA is, just discovered it in 2017. Okay. Right, well, stick to and, the record. right. They they discovered it, and then they relabel it so they can track how people talk about what they've discovered. You know, <laughs> um, as a kind of operation. So, um, but. Yeah, um, the 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 undersea thing is an interesting angle because I I think that ultimately whatever they go with, it's going to involve discovering something where nobody else can access it. Right. So right. they discovered an undersea cave. There's something in Mariana's trench. You know, there's something on the moon. There's something on Mars. There's something on Antarctica. Well, of course mm -hmm. there is, because the only people that are going there are you, right? <laughs> That's, you know, if anything you, know, you want it to be, right? Right. It's like you're, you're okay. So you're, you discovered it, right? The government and all of the scientists that are paid by the government, and they're all doing the research on it because academia is surrounded by gatekeepers that do not allow real natural researchers to do anything and then serve you on a silver platter, this new origin story, which is what I think it's going to be kind of rewrite human history and give us a new uh, prehistory, you know, give us a new origin story to just connect us with, with our spiritual um, uh, origins. Um, and uh, I also think roll roll out a, um, hyper technological society with this advanced technology that is supposed to heal that's supposed to um, sort of take over where spirituality would be but now here's this advanced technology you know right. I think I think it's going to be that sort of thing that they're ultimately positioning for if I had to say what it is and it, the location of whatever they're going to discover, whatever they're going to disclose, I think fundamentally has to be somewhere where nobody else can look at it and evaluate it and thus have another opinion about it. So. Interesting. And it could also be like an inner earth thing. I know there's a whole um, uh, scene of researchers that believe in inner earth caverns that can be reached through um going underwater and that there could be a hidden world sort of in this honeycombed earth. That's also quite a popular one as well. So. Absolutely. Um, well, we've had this kind of idea since the, you know, genies and everything else and elementals and fairies uh, intersecting our world and it's an awareness level. And then you find uh, even the stories about inner earth, they have a ring of history to yeah. them at a certain point there's no question a civilization went underground and for good reason yes. um so what we're looking at now though is like a repackaging and uh so hollow earth becomes something where hey all the nazis met up with the aliens in the hollow earth and you know there's all these yeah. things going on and, and there's the levels of civilization how do you cut through you know when you think about just what's out there now and, you know, you think about how it got there and the, the influences that we can trace, uh, theosophy, anthroposophy, all that Eastern wing, you know, the, the explosion of TM and, and all this kind of stuff that we have some idea, even that is there's, there's a lot of layers already there. How do you cut through, uh, the manipulation of narratives like that? I think in the collective sense, um, I think it's something that we're going to have to go through um, because I think that there's so many people that are not um, prepared for this topic that I think that we're going to have to go through a level of false disclosure. Um, and I think that's just going to be the awakening process. But how it starts and how it ends is very different. And what's most important is who has the last word and the truth always has the last word. Um, and so 
while there may be kind of a, you know, um, more of a showy, strange disclosure narrative that we're talking about now, um, I think that we can prepare a parallel narrative that is actually true, you know, um, that is going alongside of it. But we will have to go through ultimately the false disclosure just because I don't think we have the numbers to um, to change that too much, in my opinion. Um, mm-hmm. And I think it's all I think it's actually important to also go through kind of a false disclosure because there's been so much positioning. And it's and so I think that's actually important for humanity to go through is I think it's important sometimes to go through the lie so that you can really appreciate the truth. Um, And so I think that's what we're going to see. But the reality is, you know, about theosophy, about anthroposophy, the funny thing is, um, and this is coming from somebody who uh, was a new ager, who came into the cosmic scene, um, you know, all of this stuff was covered. All of the stuff about beings from other spheres is what they were often called. They weren't called aliens. They weren't called extraterrestrials. They weren't even considered other. You know, you know, back in the mystery schools, if there was um, a being from another sphere, you know, they were considered another kind of human being in another developmental system that's parallel to our own. But there was a way in which we could track exactly who they were in relationship to the earth. And that's that interdimensionality piece that has rules or spiritual laws around who can appear on a, on a planet. It has to do with inner earth and it has to do with um, the planet as a being. Um, But there really is no extraterrestrial. We really have that. That's going to be one of the biggest things that people have to wake up to is we're not looking at a fundamentally material phenomenon. And as long as we approach it that way, we're going to be misled. Is there, can things materialize? Yes, but it's not a material phenomenon. And that's going to be one of the biggest things. Um, And the mystery schools knew this. They knew about the interdimensional quality. And um, even John Keel and Jacques Vallée, after decades and decades of research and dedicating their life to this, came to that conclusion. Uh You know, they, after so many, examining so many cases, talking to people, you know, all the access they had, they started out thinking it was a material phenomenon. And then by the end of their life, they were convinced that it was really better described as an interdimensional phenomenon that was Mm. absolutely parallel to the idea of what you said, the jinn, um, the fairies, and every culture had a different language for it. Um, But how now that we've been shifting into this materiality, the scientific materialism, we're only perceiving the most material part of it. And so uh, if you go back... um, If you go back to even theosophy and anthroposophy, they say like beings from other spheres. And again, these were beings that that could be um, communicated with. They were they they were also considered connected to the angelic hierarchies, the spiritual hierarchies. But there was a place to put it. It wasn't like this beings coming here. Who are they? You know, you know, it, it was like there was a process there. Right. You know, so 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 we're not heading into that correctly at all. We're being brought into this as though this is a physical being with a physical ship. Um, and a lot of people are looking at it in a way that will lead to delusion, ultimately, if it's not introduced properly. So they're getting a, yeah, exactly. Well, this is really interesting because they have a whole nuts and bolts story ready, you know. Um, and they have the whole threat thing. So we have an actual office dedicated to this now. And, uh, you know, we found out just in the weirdness of the whole balloon thing that happened that a lot of those reports that they were relying on were these balloons. Uh, You know, there were a lot of balloons that were hovering outside our territory. And so some of the UFO things that got that whole UAP task force uh, you know, and all the different offices that we have for UFOs now, which are going to be funded because they're attached to this National Defense Authorization Act, you know, um, aren't coming from the actual files of the UFO file and reports and things of that nature. They're coming from anomalous stuff and just, 
you know, saying, oh, this is UFOs. So this is interesting to me because uh, they're taking the cultural narrative about the UFO thing into a different place. So let's say um, people had all these experiences in the 80s and 90s. They were abducted. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, some of them had objects left in their bodies and things of this nature. So it seems to me that part of what you're bringing across is there could be a reinterpretation around some of this instead of just thinking, hey, these are aliens coming in and testing people, that this another group operating there. Yes, I think I think the phenomenon is ultimately very complicated. And I think a lot of things are being conflated into one thing. So you have genuine interdimensional beings that are beings from other spheres or, you know, as you've mentioned before, the saintly realm, things like this. But then you also have a group that's not from another sphere at all. It's from our Earth. And it's connected to our Earth, but they pose as aliens or they pose as um these spiritual godlike beings, but they're really more like they're really more like a fallen. They're really more like fallen angels or a fallen aspect of our own of our own self. Um, and so, I would say that a lot of the technologies and a lot of things going on, I actually wouldn't place as off world at all. So I think that some of it clearly is. It's not a one size fits all. It has to be very carefully evaluated. Everything has to be very carefully discussed and evaluated for what exactly it is because it's not easy to um, place. Um, but I do think that we are also dealing with, um, I would say, a, you know, breakaway civilization from Atlantis. Mm -hmm. that did have advanced technology. And I think crypto terrestrial would fit that a lot better. Right. Um, and uh, so that's something that's a little bit different. That's not someone that's from another sphere. That's something that is attached to this sphere and through certain spiritual laws and the laws of the earth is sort of almost stuck in between or, or living parallel to us. This is why the spiritual education is so important mm -hmm. um, is because there's so much phenomenon. There's so many different types of phenomenon that can go on. Um, and so I do think that there's a parallel culture. Um, and I think that most people talk about like this darker parallel culture. And we've talked about this in our last interview um, where they have certain religious tenets. Um, and one of the tenets is genetic modification. This is a mm -hmm. very big tenant in their um, religion. Um, and also, um, I would say, being worshipped, being seen as gods. Um, I think the planet Mars is also very big in there. Um, and there's certain markers that you can see that this sort of parallel civilization functions by. You know, that's what I would say, but it's it's sort of more connected to the earth and it would be parallel to um, compared or parallel to Edgar Cayce's Belial or something like that from Atlantis that's sort of continuing on in our time. Sort of Interesting, thing. right. Uh, well, we have the story back there from Cayce and others about the Atlantean scientists and the things that they did that went wrong. Um, you know, misfiring the two eye stone, um, the creation of these half mechanical, half animal uh, mm -hmm. automatons. Yeah, that's interesting because it seems like we went through this. Maybe the earth was at a different stage, so the manifestations were far out. But how different, really, is the idea of cloning and mixing animal exactly. uh, with human tissue? I mean, it's not that different after all. It's the same thing. It's the same culture. It's the same impulse. It's the right. same It's yes. the same group. Yeah. Just doing it in this particular epoch. And we're just going around that wheel of samsara. And we're experiencing the same thing um, in a little bit of a different way, you know, and we're, we're a little bit more, um, separate from each other. Now, everything's a little bit more dense now than it was in Atlantis, but it is the same pattern. It is the same group. Things are repeating. Um, and, uh, so yeah, that's what I would, that's what I would probably say is 
important for people to understand. How do you think um, the Atlantean scientific, uh, you know, in this battle that went on between the Belial scientific groups who are after this might is right and you know, making themselves demigods and things of this nature, how does that echo out now? Um, you know, is it, we're looking maybe at themes that are coming back up again. Is it an actual reincarnation pattern? I think it is. I, I think it is an actual reincarnation pattern. Um, I think that's how it works is so that we re-experience the same thing from a slightly different angle to choose differently. Um, and so I do think we're dealing with the reincarnations of probably the same people, certainly the same themes um, and the same people. And, um, w- you know, if you, if you understand, you know, what happened in Atlantis and those themes there, it really puts the last few years into perspective. Um, and it really puts, it gives you kind of like maybe the spiritual beliefs of the people in power. Mm-hmm. Which, in a way that we haven't really seen before. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. In a way that we haven't really seen and that we need to understand if you're going to do any kind of prediction or any kind of, you know, knowing how things are going to go. You have to know how the past went if you want to know how the future is going to go. So. Do you, um, <laughs> that's really true. I think <laughs> instantly, and when I was saw these clips of the Grammys, I instantly thought of you and all the work that you've <laughs> done uh, with the In Plain uh, series that you did uh, in plain sight about all these occult rituals that take place in public. That one, as I was thinking, this reminds me so much of how these elites are just coming out and they almost can't help it at this point, uh, but expose that the level of ceremonial magic that they've interpreted and inherited, um, you know, from schools that really were trying to bring ceremonial magic in differently to the public. And they, that whole thing got hijacked and here they are doing the ultimate kind of black mass type rituals, uh, that would make like heavy metal (laughs) things like that seem like a joke. Uh, Mm -hmm. what is going on there with that? Why this, I have to be in your face with the satanic influence, just knock you over the head with it so that there's no denying it. It's just like worshiping of Satan on live network TV. I think they need your permission you know, I think that's always a huge part of it. They need to get your permission and your participation. If they have those two P's, your permission and your participation, then they can get your energy. And if they can get your energy, they can redirect it any way that they want. Right. So it's all about harvesting energy and redirecting that energy. Um, and I think there's also a sick rush and feeding that goes on as well, where we get to do the most depraved and insulting things to you, which is a form of domination, right? It's a form of, it's a form of dominating the public. We're going to do things that insult your soul, that violate you spiritually, and you're not going to do anything about it. So it's a form of humiliating you and it's also a form of dominating you and breaking you down and this is true whether you believe it or not you know whether you believe you have a soul or not you do and whether you believe you have a soul or not there are laws there are spiritual laws and they are following them um, in their sick way and i think the people that are participating in it are gone anyway i don't really think that there's much really right self-respect left there anyway so they're a black hole at this point they're a black hole yeah but it's it's to insult the public it's it's a way of dominating them um and or dominating us um so that's why they do it in plain sight (laughs) right the red was very i always look for that because the red spectrum is also very important in dark occult rights because that's the spectrum of the lower plane. So if you look, at, if you look at Rudolf Steiner's drawing of the eighth sphere, you'll see it uh, depicted as a red, um, I guess, as a red realm that's connecting. It's not the moon, but it's between the moon and the earth. It's a realm that's marked mm-hmm. by, by the orbit of the moon. And um, that is perceived as red or, or like that uh, lower infrared, I think it's called that spectrum. Mm-hmm. That's also considered a, um, 
a sort of link to the demonic plane as well by bringing that infrared spectrum or red spectrum, that color is very important in those kinds of rites. And so when you see that, just, you know, just walk away. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's interesting because they used almost the same exact lighting for the Biden domestic terrorism speech. Yes. Last fall. They and did a act- like a crazy little puppet in a, in like a demon production. <laughs> 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 It's a kind of spectrum of lighting that links directly with that that plane. Yeah. Interesting. Um, you mentioned the eighth sphere there. You've done a lot of work on the eighth sphere. Uh, you've brought it to, I think, a level where people could start to understand it. Uh, we brought it in in a series of except episodes that you and I did. And now people, it seems like, talk about it, are able to get it to a certain degree. It's been there. It's been hiding out in the Steiner literature. And now we have this kind of renaissance around it and around people understanding the Aramonic uh, piece. Aramon is interesting because that's kind of an Aramon display, the yeah. Grammys piece. It so really like, is. Yeah. So he's gone, he's gone prime time. <laughs> he's prime time. He's trotting around within the audience. Oh yeah, he's loving that kind of stuff. Absolutely. If it humiliates you, if it insults you, he's eating. You know, right. food for the moon. <laughs> so. uh, when you get to the eighth sphere and you think about you know the next levels that they've taken us um, with the technology. And, you know, in a sense, I mean, you and I both are kind of fans of technology. This is the weird thing. So this is not from the, oh, hey, technology is bad. And the other thing is also, you know, when it comes to music shows being sexy and bad or something like that, you know, I don't even care. (laughs) The the thing is, this isn't about, and one thing I worry about is a whole like Ayatollah type wave coming in, you know, which would be the other thing they could do, come in with serious conservatism. A fascist uh, version of conservatism to be like, hey, you know, can't smoke in public and that kind of thing. Um, but it's interesting to me because here we are, we're people who understand technology and use it on a daily basis. And yet both of us can tell that the thing that's being constructed, especially around younger minds who go into deeper and deeper levels of this uh, with less and less layers of protection, you're going into a virtual reality realm. And they even try to rent out, you know, uh, the metaverse, uh, real estate in the metaverse with yeah. tons and tons of investment around that didn't do very well. But um, where is that going, Gigi? And that is the epitome of, hey, I'm renting my room in the eighth sphere. I mean, yes. I mean, the metaverse logo is actually an eight. You know, right. it's actually a, a lemon skate. Exactly. So is the neural link logo. I don't know if anyone noticed that. But and Saint Elon is, you know, he's doing everything to clean up Twitter, don't you know? <laughs> um, yeah, that was an interesting that was an interesting interesting op- operation. And that was an interesting operation trying to gain trust. <laughs> um, so <laughs> anyhow, but yeah, the the uh, the it, it's not that you can't use technology or you have to like throw your phone in the lake or something. It's that technology cannot replace your spiritual connection. You can't long for technology to fulfill something within you that is ultimately only going to be fulfilled by God. Um, And so that's the real risk. You know, there's, uh, there's obviously a healthy use of technology that allows us to connect right now, you know, um, and, you know, get so much knowledge and all amazing things. But if it's taking the place of your relationship with God, your self-development, if you're addicted, if you're looking for your light in that, um, then which a lot of younger generations now are. Um, and that is where our Amon rests is when you replace the technology for spiritual development. And it's actually going to get, I think, worse and worse because I think there's also going to be technologies introduced that are, healing and they introduce like a vibrational like frequency or um certain spiritual technologies that are completely external and um, are all about affecting an individual from the outside in when our era of development is about inside out Mm -hmm. there's also going to be i think maybe Um, some strange technologies that are spiritual technologies, but they're not really spiritual. 
they're sort of more harmonic. They're going to normalize this idea then of you sort of volunteering to become a cyborg because you'll be augmented. Yes, exactly. They're going to introduce that augmentation by hooking you up to a machine because it'll regulate something or it'll allow you to have a clairvoyant experience or well, whatever. And there's spiritual, it's a, it's a spiritual experience, but it's not at all. It's just a simulated um it's just a simulated experience all around. So interesting. And that does make me think of Steiner immediately. <laughs> this is the thing about Steiner too. I don't want to turn him into one of those, Hey, he predicted this and he predicted that guys, you know, and we have lots of people who are hardcore about predictions now. And like, you know, I predict this for 2025, everything's coming down. The crash is coming. You know, I think predictions are terrible. In fact, <laughs> I don't, I mean, and it's a tough way to live. Right. Um, but there are themes that are laid out in advance. And it seems like some of those themes, let's say with the mystery schools, earth changes, um, you know, a number of different things that were left letting us know that you're heading into this very, very difficult 21st century in terms of navigating these forces all coming in at once. But Steiner at a certain point when he's talking about Aramon, and again, his, his, the thrust I would say of his Aramon work is that for me, he spent four decades trying to articulate, look, you have this force coming in, dark astral force, which is somehow wrapped up in the evolution of the earth. And it's going to come out and face humanity in this hyper, you know, through the technology of this period. And he specifies the period as the one that we're in going all the way through uh, this hundred year period. So, um, at a certain point, he says, well, Armand is going to give everyone their own set of clairvoyance. And so it, it's not going to match up very well because each person will have clairvoyance. What is that getting at? Mm -hmm. So we're getting to that where, you know, we know that uh, when we have Facebook or Amazon listening to our devices instantly, they start producing ads and all this kind of thing. Does it get to the point where they read our thoughts? There has been. I mean, I think people watching are probably thinking of that weird time where they never Googled anything <laughs> they never said, and they never said anything out loud. But then that ad appears on their phone about that thing they never spoke out loud about. Do you have, has that ever happened to you where you didn't Google oh, yeah. anything? You didn't yeah. Google anything. You didn't say anything out loud. You were just like, huh, I think I might have this or I think I might need this. And then the ad shows up and you're like, how, you know what I mean? That has, that has um, happened. And it makes me wonder whether or not they, they, that that does exist. Although I'm not too educated in that kind of how that technology would work or anything, but. It, it sounds like it's operational. I mean, I've personally had experiences and let us know in the comments, you guys, if you've had an experience where you have seen something that you've only thought about appear in an ad because it's always about making that money, right? So they 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 always monetize whatever stuff they probably have. Um, but I think that he, there is no cheap way into clairvoyance. And I think that, you know, you have to earn your ability to see into other worlds through the purification of your own heart and also through the dedication to service. That's the only way and often sacrificing yourself and often parts of your own life for that. That's the only way that you get to see into other worlds is if you're completely dedicated to service mm -hmm. um, and you are dedicated to purifying your own heart and your own self. So clearing your trauma you know, facing that. So it's connected to self-development, personal development, personal responsibility, um, and then dedication to to loving and being in service. That's the only way that those abilities happen. Um, and they don't happen in one life. They happen, you have to do it life after life after life after life. And there's an unf unfoldment that happens where um, eventually you become stronger and stronger um, and you can actually handle um, the reality of these abilities, because those kinds of abilities that are spiritual abilities, they come with the dark and the light. If you want to see into the light realms, you have to overcome that dark side too. 
And so, there, yes. And so this is why the mystery schools would go through grades of initiation where you would be guided into different um, questions about yourself and considerations and ponderings that had directly to do with the collective. And there was a specific way that you were brought into these things in our ancestral past. Um, and so the idea that you can just put a chip in your brain or that you can um, take DMT or some kind of plant medicine or some kind of hallucinogen to open the door and then have like a machine hooked up to you or something, these are, this is not the same thing. And um, it's a different thing entirely, actually. It's actually a different thing entirely. So you can't even call that clairvoyance. You can't even use these kinds of words for that because it's just not the same thing. It's literally um, uh, trying to uh, do something that's an internally based process using external means. And when you do that, you completely give up your sovereignty, by the way. Um, to whoever has created these machines that give you the clairvoyance or to whoever is giving you these um, hallucinogenic drugs, because that's usually what, that's how I see it is that mm -hmm. I see these um, massive sort of DMT cults coming forward eventually in the next few decades and um, hallucinogenic plant medicines and, and misusing those mm -hmm. in order to break people open which is part of mind control. It's part of MK Ultra, right? Is is the use of these plant medicines, mushrooms, DMT, LSD. I mean, with MK Ultra, they the what, what, one of the guys from MK Ultra used to joke. He said, "We bought all the LSD in the world." <laughs> so, so I I see that part of me thinking about like how how would Armand manifest? Like how would he how would he appear on stage? Um, I think that it would be, I think that there would be a machinery and things like that, which is very harmonic. But I also think that they're probably, what you see in MKUltra is probably pretty close, is the mm -hmm. use of forcing people um, into spiritual states that are unearned or, or forcing people into these um, uh, disassociation, basically. Right. And think, that's how I think he would manifest personally. Right. That's defenses down for an individual uh, in service to this being. And it's interesting. You can get the whole culture to lower their shields yeah. uh, under conditions like that. Because like you're saying, hey, they introduce all these illnesses and then they're like, the only way you can get well from these strange illnesses we created is for you to take this little chip under the skin that regulates your body and your metabolism and all these things. And it's going to be great. The only problem is it connects you directly to that central machine. Exactly. And it's like, is, is there a more perfect way to introduce transhumanism than to severely damage neurologically the entire population or damage their bodies, damage their heart to the point where you can't lead a normal life? But guess what? Oh my gosh, you won't, you will not believe the technology we have. We can regulate that. We can, and you know what? You'll be better off. You'll be better than you ever were before. So it's creating these vulnerabilities. Um, and then of course, having the solution and most people would never, ever even. And I think the reason is because most people may not be, you know, awake, but they have some sensibility to not, walk into Armand's trap or not walk into these degraded practices that are again, part of this degenerate group that's been on the arts for a long time religion. This is part of their religion. That's how mm -hmm. I see it. This is the, the, these are all part of their religious tenets. Um, right. that, you know, they wouldn't walk into that if they had a choice, but now if you have uh, a lot of health issues um, and you, you may think differently. So this is how that's how they're getting in. In fact, so yes. you can get in through greed, you know, with the financial system at a certain point, everyone I knew was working for a financial company. I'm like, what's going on here? You know, people used to have diversification of jobs. And, uh, I remember, you know, in my twenties, everyone was like, Oh, I'm working for this financial services company, including me. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it, it is interesting because they came in with this greed piece. And then the other thing now, it's, it's health care, but it's not, again, it's not what's put out there as health care. And we talk about these labels and what they really actually represent because the idea of health care is great, right? Yes. But um, 
Armonic Healthcare is here, inject this thing into you, become part of the machine, I'm going to make you a cyborg, and you'll be healthier as a cyborg. That's different. That's a heck of a lot different because you're yeah. challenging the barrier of what it is uh, to be a human being, which is totally different than yeah. saying, I have something here which will alleviate the ills of humanity, which is, you know, an organic process. Yes, exactly. It's, it's, uh, and it's, it's it takes advantage of the most vulnerable vulnerable people in society as well um, when they do things like this. Um, so that's why it's extremely sick. You know, they do the same thing with with climate change, as you've you know so eloquently pointed out on your show so many different times. Is where they, you know, um, damage the planet. These huge corporations, you know, and they profited immensely. It's actually one of the reasons why they have the money. And then they blame the cows in the field. And they blame right. you, you can't have a barbecue in your backyard or a gas stove, you know, and it's the same. It's this it's demeaning, isn't it? Like it's it's um, it's it's the same thing. You create an injury, you damage people and then you make, you, you know, they suffer even more. So um, it's the same sort of pattern. And that, like, if you boiled it down to an individual, that's like a narcissistic psychopath, right? Exactly. It, yeah. It's world government. Watch out. Exactly. And, and then, and then it's like most people I've seen, you know, there's so many people that just don't believe that psychopaths exist or that they could organize into like a group of psychopaths and like act together, um, so, <laughs> which is clearly what's going on. The um, government means well, it's just incompetence. Don't you know? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> oh, no, yeah. That's going to be Gigi. a... You reminded me of something we were talking back there. And as usual, when I talk to you, my brain plugs into like 90 different uh, centers. It's interesting. There's a, a, a director who directed these documentaries back in the early 70s. He was going to put out a huge UFO disclosure documentary for the Nixon administration before the Nixon administration got into trouble. And uh, he told this whole story, and he said they had footage of UFO landing and all these other things. But one of the interesting things that happened with him is they gave him access in the Pentagon to walk around and see the programs that they were working on. And one of them included, uh, that he notes, is included a soldier. In, now, this is 1972. And the soldier is has these electrodes on connected to a TV screen. And he's trying to visualize things like horses stars, pyramids, whatever it happens to be, and they are appearing through the static of the screen and forming into shapes that he's thinking. That's 1972. So when you were talking about, you know, the Facebook ads and Amazon and activating all this internet advertising based on your thoughts, they were working on it 50 years ago. My guess is they actually have it. Oh, yeah. I, I That is... You know what, too, that as you were saying that I was getting the vision of, did you hear about that guy who I think the CIA probably found him at some point, but he could actually take like a blank, a blank piece of film? Yes. Like, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, Ted Serios. And he could actually put a scene on a camera. Right. He had this whole thing where he could impress upon any camera whatever he was thinking. So that was, you know, the Eiffel Tower, bang. It's yeah. right there, it appears in the film. So is, is that something, like if a, if a film strip can pick it up and it's from the mind or from the, fr fr or, or is it is it like an image that's actually appearing in the energy body? And mm -hmm. then, but the, I mean, yeah, I, I believe they probably do, which is very creepy. Right. But I'd like to think that there's some secured lines, you know, <laughs> going on. <laughs> but, well, everyone's just going to walk around paranoid after that one. Yeah. Um, yeah. Sorry, guys. Let's just, <laughs> you see, uh, I mean, that is interesting, though, thinking about the military working on who's good at sending this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you, uh, let's take someone like you. How the military would love to have someone who could envision these things, right? So they would, they would take a Gigi Young and they would utilize her for a program like that. And they'd get all this psychic information based on the fact that, you know, oh, we've been able to monitor and test Gigi Young in these programs like they did really in SRI. And then the CIA has all that information. 
Gigi, what is the next step of what they're doing with it? Obviously, they have a psychic tool in mind. Yeah, wow. Well, they could... Well, there's lots of things that are actually coming into my mind right now with it, but they could, they could obviously use it in a very manipulative way yeah. um, in lots of different ways. But I actually think that there's certain technologies that don't work unless uh -huh. there's certain images that can be produced or certain frequencies that are created. Um, and there's just, I think, certain things that cannot be accessed unless these things are produced within a human being. So I think that's one thing. I think also um, you could have these memories and experiences and if they have not yet pierced the veil of the collective, there's great power in that. So there's- Oh, I see, yes. So, so there's always, from what I understand, there's always, um, there's like classical information that is spiritual science. Right. Mm -hmm. And um, all mystics should know this and, and teach this and understand this. But there's another level of information that is um, uh, visionary information. Um, and it is very hard to get right. Um, and because you have to really offer a part of yourself to get to, to get it. So not every psychic can function on a visionary level, but pretty much every psychic can work within what's already created. Not every, mm -hmm. not every psychic can channel a piece of information for the time that is visionary for the time. Does, does that make sense? Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. So there's well, it reminds me about the mirror idea, which is, you know, uh, mystics have talked about this where you get into a certain place where you can see it. It's like looking at a reflection in a mirror, but you can't touch the thing. So like a CIA program might get a kind of superficial layer of how that psychic process works, but they can't embody it. Mm -hmm, uh, yes. Somebody who's a natural mystic would. Yes. And then obviously they could make the technology work. If there was a technology like that, they could make the technology work and they could exploit and create a false experience for the world. Right. Right. And, and, and also, um, Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, if you have, and this is a particular, there's, there's certain, uh, there's, there's certain visionary experiences and pieces of information that need to come forward to like initiate an age and mm -hmm. that information and, and vision and experience cannot come forward until the time that the, the right time and not a moment sooner, not a moment later. So nobody knows what that chapter is going to be. Nobody knows what that energy is going to be but there has to be some people who embody that and they'll do it at the right time. And so if a group could get a hold of that information and that vision, those symbols, that imagery, that feeling and that experience, they could use that to manipulate the public into something um, because the public would automatically trust them. Right. Because there's something there that they remembered. Does that make sense? And if there was a yeah. technology, if there was a technology that could augment that or create that or replace the psychic or something, that would be that 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 could be very dangerous because it would be used in the wrong way. I yeah, you know, that's really interesting. And I'm glad that we're getting at the precautions on this because there's there's a lot of noise out there around these things. And we've talked about it, um, you know, whether it's that kind of Gaia TV level of buzzword around consciousness, spirituality, and things of this nature. Now, you know, we know that there's a whole superficial kind of marketing layer there, but I feel like there's a heavy, heavy, heavy intel piece that goes along mm -hmm. with that. When you look at it uh, as someone who's, you know, engaged that whole world of things, you know, and I know a lot of those companies try to drag you into the projects that they're doing as well, but you keep yourself really doing your own thing because you know that there's something not quite right about what's happening in there. Yes. I think the, um, how, how I see it is that I think that this group comes into fields like ours and I think they milk it 
And I think that they often abuse people. And I've just heard so many different stories from people in this field, like you and I, that have these meetings with people from these big television shows and these networks and these publishing houses. And it ends up being a Faustian sort of bargain. Interesting. And it ends up being... (laughs) That's really true. Yeah, it ends up being kind of like a Faustian bargain. And the bottom line, how I see it is, is I don't think that these individuals could even handle or are ready for the kinds of forces that are coming in. They, they wouldn't understand it anyway, uh-huh. um, because the level that a lot of these individuals in these darker groups are functioning at, I don't think they could even really perceive it properly, you know? So I think, I, I, I think that there's a desperate need from these groups to harvest information you know like from the x series i see your show harvested all the time i've seen my information harvested so there's this desperate need to stay current and to try to get this clear fresh information but then put it into their weird system which is all about which is all about like making money and maybe creating these little cults and these it's just putting it towards all this weird stuff and I see it all the time and so much money gets pumped into these various different propaganda networks as well um and so oh, no question like yeah. like there, there is no I mean I was thinking about this the other day like there I mean when you're a doctor or you are a lawyer you know you have that pinnacle of your career where you're like well you could work your way up and you could get this and it's like in our field you know there really isn't that great <laughs> You know what I mean? It's the, yeah. the, the, the very top of our field. Maybe it's actually like this in every career now at this point, but the very top, the most popular things in our field are often the things that I would tell people to stay very far away from. <laughs> right, exactly. So yeah. that's the things that have those million dollar budgets, yeah. millions and millions of dollars of, of, of budgets and and these people that get pushed, like the TTSA, like like the Lou Elizondo crowd, all of this kind of stuff. These are the things I would stay very far away from. Um, oh, yeah. and, but but they're the most. They're on you know they're on the network news. You know they're on Gaia, right? right. But these are the things that um, um, this is a very. I see it as a very sophisticated propaganda network. Personally, to speak plainly. Wow. Yes, absolutely. Uh, and <laughs> boy, that's really true. I've seen so much of your stuff hijacked over time and none of it comes even close to what you do. You know? I was, yeah. I was actually like doing something for Mars mysteries and I was going through, this is weird. And I was, uh, you know, I was, I was going through Gaia and, uh, I was, I was going through their catalog and I had no idea. I literally came across an episode and I, it was from years ago. There was someone literally telling one of my stories that I, well, it was my own, I heard my own work. Wow. Yeah. Was, at, at first I was very, at, at, like entering very naively. I was like, oh, someone had that experience too. Like that's what <laughs> I thought. And then I was like, oh no, this is my experience. Oh, it's classic. Yeah. And other people have had that as well. So, yeah. I, you know, this is interesting to me because I've emphasized this for 2023, which is potency becomes the most important aspect of this because even the mainstream media is willing on a certain level, a superficial level to cover these things because they see, ah, people are interested in, you know, like a lot of the topics that we cover the UFO file, Atlantis, I mean, even those, you know, they don't really capture the full spectrum of the way that we're talking about it because, you know, someone might say, well, the UFO thing, you know, and there's all this kind of very um, degraded material in the field now that wasn't even there 10 years ago. Yes. It's, it's actually very empty. If, if, I mean, it hasn't, I mean, this field it's in the news more than ever. I mean, I can't log into into the Twitter machine without the, <laughs> the UA, you know, the, the you know UFO trending. Maybe it's just because I like them, but um, <laughs> you know, but but the quality of information is is lower than ever, yes. and it's the same conversation over and over and over again. Um, and usually, it is about technology. 
It's just, mm -hmm. you, you know, real advanced like conversations about advanced technology, which leads you to think that they're looking for a defense budget on this. Yes. You know, so you're like, okay, well, you know, here we go. Um, and then um, because the technology is always going to the conversation with the technology, no matter how material it is, it's always going to have a point where it goes spiritual. Right. As you were talking about the Atlantean technology where someone can enter into the technology and project their vision for like yeah. an operation kind of yeah. thing. Um, it, there's, a, there's a point where advanced technology is advanced is because it has apotheum, right? Mm -hmm. Which is the word you coined for the X or for that, for that thing. So we're not really talking about just technology. We're talking about consciousness. And so then you, so then you're like, okay, well, what's the most popular thing with consciousness? And it's like, then you go to Gaia mm -hmm. and it's, and it's, you know, blue chickens or it's, you know, these, <laughs> it's, it's somebody telling I, say, I almost forgot about that, but yes. <laughs> it's, like, yeah. it's, it's this story. It's like this, it's, it's these, um, these new origin stories. But if you, if you, if you look at it, it ends up being like you go into the consciousness aspect or the woo aspect or the spirituality aspect. And it auto it automatically goes into like Anunnaki alien mm -hmm. gods, um, all of these different kinds of alien beings, um, a new human creation myth. Then it goes into like Atlantis and it, it has the same pattern across the board, but nowhere in that is actually any real empowering sentiment. It's just sort of like telling you what your history is, you know, telling you how you were created, telling you that all these alien beings are in this galactic federation fleet in a centralized government force protecting you. You know, we don't, <laughs> we don't like the United Nations. We don't like corruption and things like that, but it's okay when there's aliens up there doing it. Hey, you know, listen, this is, the, this is where it goes. This is, this is the, that's where, that's where it tends to go. And yes. it's, it's not very satisfying, you know, <laughs> for it's fascinating because it, I was thinking about how they did the whole space president thing with Elon. And this is what they're building up. They're like, you know, Elon's putting up that whole series of satellites and everything. And there was during the whole balloon thing, you had, uh, you know, General Flynn who got mixed up in so many weird things around Trump and Obama. And he's like, you know, oh, please, you know, let's get information and get that balloon down and all this stuff. And he's putting the message to the Defense Department and Elon Musk. You know, Elon Musk owns SpaceX. He's a corporate individual, probably multiple individuals own, you know, his different corporate entities. But isn't that weird? Now we're getting this idea that this guy can solve things that are in our space, you know, and this is a general who had a, a very high position at the DIA and he's saying, oh, Elon, please get to the bottom of this. I mean, what's going on there? I think that, I think that there's <laughs> definitely, I think that there's been, I think that there's an effort, an ongoing effort to probably pitch Elon as some kind of um, presidential figure or some yeah. kind of you know, political hero. I think, you know, initially when he purchased Twitter, um, he was sort of playing a role in the beginning where he was almost acting as though he was going to be the arbiter of truth or the hero of truth. Um, and they have all those memes of him hugging the constitution. So. Yes, exactly. There was, <laughs> he was, he was rescuing you know, he was rescuing the people and, and, and free speech, which obviously many Americans want. And so there was also a little bit of a positioning of him there yeah. I think, in people's minds. And then and then um, so there so there's sort of positioning him as this, you know, this libertine, this person who's for liberty and freedom. And but meanwhile, it's it's confusing because when you look at a lot of his objectives, what he said are actually very anti freedom. You know, like he's actually lines up a lot with the World Economic Forum and, and a lot of his his desires. And obviously Neuralink, you know, his ultimate goal with that is actually to have everyone hooked up to that. That's the that's the most unfree thing I've ever heard of personally. 
Um, Unbelievable. Yeah. It's actually a kind of prison ultimately. And it's, it's so I think that he's playing a role. I think that we can't look at Elon Musk, someone with that much money and that much power um, and think that this person is acting alone. You know, he represents, as you mentioned, a panel of people. And what we're looking at is an unelected individual that's trying to have the power of someone who probably should be elected. And they're taking advantage of the reality that we're in a time where there's a lot of newness. Like we don't really know how to handle um, a lot of the um, technological advancements that we have, the kind of technical culture that we've become. It's sort of transcended a lot of our original understandings of how the constitution is even understood. Yeah. Oh, that yeah. makes sense. Like we're kind of in this weird level of, of advancement where we're very vulnerable. And, mm -hmm. I, and I think they're trying to create a new leadership. Um, but the reality, he's unelected, he, you know, um, and uh, it goes against the American culture, against the constitution, Bill of Rights, everything to, and it's like it's also like when he sent the satellite, the Starlink satellites to the Ukraine as well. Yes. Um, you know, he's it's sort of like he's achieving these means that are probably for the um, the individuals that he represents quietly. Mm -hmm. Those are that's who he's representing. He's not representing the people. I think that what he's doing, if anything, is to gain trust. Right. So. Well, it's almost like um, during the whole COVID piece, they had to lock down everyone from talking to each other. They got rid of people, you know, forget about the Bill of Rights, you know, anti-free speech, clamp it down, clamp it down. But when you get to a certain point with that, you risk a real pendulum swing in the other direction and people really throwing you out. So you have to insert a bulwark. Exactly. Yeah. And he, the, the whole thing that they did with Twitter is that experiment and that part of the problem with it, I think, is that all the conservatives uh, who, who just looking for some kind of champion in media, media, understandably, but they, they went for this too quickly and too yeah. passively. And so now it's a weird thing. You're going back and forth. They did the same thing with Trump to a certain degree. Uh, you know, we saw that during his administration, but I think the question I want to ask you, Gigi, is what are they building this for in the 2020s here? Where are they going in this period with the propaganda piece of, you know, taking an individual like that? You know, because they don't have the, – the Elon model is different than Bezos, for example. Bezos quietly buys things up in the background, right? He buys Whole Foods and makes it into, hey, this is going to be, you know, the automation robot hub and we won't need people to be cashiers and all that stuff. That's one type of operation. But the Elon one is different. It, it is. And I think that we can notice like a net positive move. Like I think somebody who is a controlled bulwark can, we can notice it when they do something that's overall good. That's yeah. overall for freedom. And they will do that. But it doesn't mean that we worship that person and that because they made some good moves that everything that they do is therefore good. So it's this tribal mindset that we have to avoid yeah. Um, you know, we can say, you know, cause even, even a, even a broken, what's that phrase? Even a, even a broken clock can be right twice a, twice a day. <laughs> right. Oh yeah. So I think, I think it's just important to understand that and not approach this tribally so that we can have a very balanced vision because, you know, where the money is placed right now, um, I, I don't think there's been enough exposure of, of the corruption to think that anyone's a totally free operator. Exactly. That would, that would get, that would warrant some kind of respect in that regard. You know, we're on some thin ice. So um, I think, I think the one of the most concerning things I think with Elon that people don't really think about is I think he parallels Werner von Braun a lot. Interesting. Yes. And so um you know, we were just talking about rituals and I think it's, I think that it's, it needs more attention. And I think it's actually pretty concerning that Elon, um, the name appeared in Warner Von Braun's uh, Project Mars. Yes. Um, in, in Project Mars, he names the Elon as being the head of the parliament. 
He also describes a challenging time on the earth where the war would, where the world would be at war with Russia. Now, Von Braun felt like this was going to be around the 80, around 83 or the 80s or something like that. But mm -hmm. that didn't come to pass. But there was still this, this concept that he was painting in his book, which is fiction. Um, but it was sort of like his dream. It's very technical as well, very technical equations and things like that. But Von Braun's vision was that the world would go to war with Russia. And after a long, drawn-out war, the population would become broken down and psychologically damaged. And then a um, governing body would arise, kind of like the United Nations or something. Um, he goes into more detail about that um, in his book, but they rise and they actually build a base on the moon and they put weapons on the moon and they put weapons in space. And then after that, they go to Mars. And that was what Werner von Braun said in his, his project Mars using the name Elon. Now secret societies will do that. Secret societies will use names in a very specific way. And if you see someone that's that powerful, using certain names, you need to pay attention because it's part of how they, um, it's part of how they function. It's part of how they get permission. So for me, that's something to pay attention to on the occult side. And, you know, so now, now I see the, the, this war with Russia again. And I think about what Werner von Braun wrote. And I, and I think about the reality that, you know, we still haven't addressed the fact that there is a lot of Nazi roots. Well, Joseph Farrell has done a wonderful job, obviously, on pointing this out. But that's also something that needs to be addressed. And, and it's, it's not often addressed because, you know, people don't talk about Nazis in the right way. Mm -hmm. They talk about it in a, a, a totally inflammatory and shallow way and a mm -hmm. superstitious way, not in a way where they actually understand what they believe. Interesting. And they actually understand their origin myth and they actually understand um, uh, their core character. So I think that we're going to have to revisit <laughs> some of that. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah. Because Elon is, is, is carrying out Werner von Braun's plan. I mean, Werner von Braun, his lodestar was Mars. He always wanted to, that was his thing. Anyone who worked with him in, in Huntsville in Alabama, when he was doing all of his work said like Werner wants to go to Mars. This is what he wants. This is his dream. Hmm. He had a religious feeling and a spiritual feeling about Mars. And so when you see Elon doing the same thing, they even have the same, um, uh, there, there's a belief in um, that I found in Nazi esoterica, which is an opposite belief to what a lot of the mystery schools taught, um, which is this belief about the sun dying or the sun exploding and the world dying. Now, in most of the higher schools, I would say, or, 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 or certain like theosophy and anthroposophy, you evolve with your sun and your star. Mm -hmm. your, um, but then what they're talking about is something different. They, in, in some of the origin myths in um, the Nazi occult literature, their progenitors are fleeing a destroyed star system. That's what they believe. And they believe that a planet is ultimately going to die and they have to move to another one. They believe in planet colonization and planet hopping. And so this is exactly what Elon Musk also believes. He believes that the world is eventually going to die and that humanity has to go and colonize another world. The problem with that is that you cannot go to another planet and make it come alive. Right. Every planet has a scheduled process of life and prelaya. It's called prelaya in, in, in the theosophical tradition and also in anthroposophy. So you can't, you know, an individual can't go to a planet and force it alive. Right. You, also, you, you know, um, and so, but there's this playing God aspect mm -hmm. that is very much in the Nazi esoterica, particularly it's different. It's a, it's a different belief system 
than other paths when it comes to cosmology. Other paths believe that you evolve with your star, with your sun. Um, mm-hmm. but, but this is a different, it's almost like a divergent timeline, a divergent history, a divergent human history. Um, does that make sense? Oh, no question. What's fascinating to me is the the language that he uses uh, in relation to the Mars mission is we need to preserve the light of consciousness. Yeah, and that's and that's you don't need to do that. It's mm-hmm. already preserved. It's within mm-hmm. you. It's within your being. Right. No, and 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 like when you pat like the Earth is going to pass into a higher sphere. It's going mm-hmm. to go through its two more um, epochs, and then it's going to pass into an even higher vibrational sphere. I know many people watching this may be like, what is this lady talking about? But there's actually a precise science to the evolution of the earth and to human beings that mm-hmm. where the planet actually like sinks in density, which is known as the biblical fall. And then it also rises and spiritualizes out. And so you don't need to force that. You need to, we need to align with that mm-hmm. and we follow it because we are the planet and we are the sun. We don't need to get ahead of it. We don't need to get it. So it's this lost there. It's this, this playing God mentality that has been perpetuated perhaps for an extremely long period of time. And this impulse is now alive in a lot of different people, but it it goes against um, the natural order of things. Well, that's interesting about, because it seems like as we're coming out then, (laughs) you know, coming into that higher uh, sphere idea of the planet, then that's what's being blocked. This is the thing, yeah. because if it comes out of that, then all those entities that have attached, mm-hmm. you know, that kind of harmonic rule, uh, that goes out the window and they've exactly. been doing quite well with it. Exactly. And maybe that's what this is really all about is um, creating and de- creating that eight sphere in a very technological way. Um, and, uh, maybe that's the level of the eighth sphere that we're looking at today is actually the creation of it physically or in, in an etheric way with electricity, with the, eth- the, the sort of super frequencies that we're in. Um, maybe it involves the moon and Mars as well. Um, and, uh, so it's a different impulse though, um, than to, it's, a, it's, it's not an evolutionary impulse, it's a devolutionary impulse. Is that, that's the best. It's backwards impulse. Gigi, absolutely fascinating. You've outdone yourself today for sure. Stay right there. The conversation continues at darkjournalist.com, and we'll go deeper with Gigi on the UFO file. Now, Gigi's membership site uh, with courses and webinars of just remarkable esoteric information available at ggyoung.com. Of course, her YouTube series, Mars Mysteries, uh, absolutely absolutely fascinating, available with a simple search, powerful and potent information for the times we're in. Please join us at darkjournalist.com. Now, we'll see you on Fridays at 8 p.m. with the X-Series. Don't miss it. We'll see you then.